Welcome to Conversations in Science, hosted by the Buffalo Museum of Science. My name is Gabrielle Graham, and I am the Community Partnerships and Adult Programs Manager at the Buffalo Museum of Science. This presentation is recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel, where we maintain a playlist of all of our past conversations in science for people to come back and revisit. So if you enjoy this video, please consider sharing it with your friends and family. You can use the chat function throughout the program to send questions to your hosts. That's myself, Casey, and Joe. You can also use the hand raise function to ask a question at the end. Um, feel free to use questions in the chat throughout the presentation and we can relay those to our speaker. Originally, these programs were held at the museum with conversations at the end, um, but really this program has had a much longer lifetime in the virtual sphere. So we are very pleased to be able to bring it to you here virtually today. We'd like to thank RP Oak Hill Building Company for their continued support and presenting sponsorship of Conversations in Science. And it's the support of our sponsors, donors, and members of the museum that enable us to continue our mission and serve our community. So now I am going to unspotlight myself and we are gonna send this over to Casey and Joe. You've got the floor, Joe, if you would like to begin the slides. Oh, so again, it's Gabrielle. Uh, I am the Community Partnerships and Adult Programs Manager for the Buffalo Museum of Science. We'll pass to Casey. Hi, everybody. My name is Casey. I'm the Collections Manager here at the Buffalo Museum of Science. I have been working here since 2011, and I'm happy to be here tonight. So without further ado, we're going to go to our presenter, Joe Butch. Hi, Joe Butch. I've been involved indirectly with the museum actually since the 60s. Uh, this book, The Geology of Erie County, is a very famous uh, Buffalo Museum of Science publication. I'm very fortunate Irving Tesmer was my undergraduate advisor at Buffalo State in the 60s, and Edward Bueller was my graduate advisor at UB in the 70s. This book uh, has a uh, geologic map of Erie County, New York. This is a bedrock geology. Each uh, color on the map represents the, uh, the uh, a for geologic formation that's uh, close to the surface in that particular area. Uh, I've lived most of my life, exception of a few times when I had jobs out of town, but uh, in, in Western New York, so much of my uh, background is locally. Uh, the uh, involvement with my, my um, involvement with the Buffalo Museum of Science has been through one of its affiliates organizations, the Buffalo Geological Society. Uh, the Buffalo Geological Society has many activities. Uh, one of the big ones is the annual Gem and Mineral and Fossil Show. For those in the know about geology and geologists, you'll see a lot of very famous people that have participated and visited our show, uh, including uh, a staff from the Buffalo Museum of Science. Uh, the collections in any museum, a large amount of the collections are tucked away in drawers and the like, but uh, here we have uh, little opportunities that come up now and then to share the collections with the public, uh, sometimes inside the museum here with a uh, public areas, we bring some things down and, and share these, or sometimes we take some things from the collection, uh, like in this case, it's to the Gem and Mineral Show, uh, and uh, share these with the public based on the theme of the show. I, I believe that this year the theme was garnets, or sometimes uh, somebody would work with the collections on a, a, a project and then give a presentation at a public meeting. Uh, this is one of my students who was interested in meteorites, and he did some research here using the collection at the museum, and he gave a presentation uh, at the uh, uh, Gem and Mineral Show. Uh, our collections in geology are very, very extensive. We have uh, fossils, uh, uh, mostly Paleozoic. Uh, we have uh, one of the world's largest collection of Eurypterids. Uh, we have a special room with uh, certain fossils called pipe fossils. And these are things that um, are uh, in the geologic literature. Sometimes they may have been the, the original uh, fossil described. We have an extensive collection of minerals uh, a lot early in the history of the museum and in the history of the Buffalo Geological Society. Uh, there were many people who were uh, amateur mineralogists, uh, very uh, serious collectors and, and students of mineralogy, and um, who uh, contributed a lot to the museum. If you look at some of the uh, 
material in our collection, there's a lot of famous names of who collected it or identified it or donated it. We have uh, things like drill cores and uh, models and parts of previous displays. And this is an important thing for research uh, field collections from uh, previous research. Uh, we have and uh, uh, we have Jensen collection, the Tesmer collection, the Bastido collection, and the like. So if somebody wanted to revisit some of the work that some of these other people have done, we have those collections here. Uh, the collection is is huge, and it's grown uh, ever since the uh, 19th century uh, with all the uh, avid mineral collectors. But a lot of uh, work was done on paleontology and stratigraphy from the Buffalo Museum of Science. Uh, this area, New York State in general, is a very uh, important in the history of geology. The New York State Ge Geological Survey is one of the oldest geological surveys in the world. And there's a lot of early 20th century, late 19th century publications that were published jointly by both the Buffalo Society of Natural Sciences and the uh, New York State Geological Survey. One of the biggest contributors recently to the uh, growth of the collection is the Byron Day. There's oh, a- Oh, wait, uh, Joe, oops. right before you pass on, can you go back one slide? Um, so paleontology, that's the study of dinosaurs and fossil remains, correct? Fossils, yes. And then, and then what is stratigraphy? Oh, okay, sorry about that. I if the, uh, uh, not all of the viewers are geologists. Um, stratigraphy is the study of strata. You know, I'm gonna go back a few more slides here. Uh, whoops, there we go. The uh, underlying layers of rock, the strata, and um, there's some interesting uh, developments uh, with people from New York State in the history of the development of stratigraphy. Um, and so if, if so stratigraphy is like if as if the rocks were um, a lasagna or something. Or uh, like a, that's a, good. That's good. You're making me hungry. But yes, okay. that's a very really good analogy. <laughs> a layer cake is another okay. yeah. way. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what we would do is that uh, each rock layer represents, uh, in this particular case, these are all flat lying sedimentary rocks. They represent material that was deposited on the seafloor at, at some time in the past. And um, the uh, particular rock is a fancy word for the uh, what was composed called lithology, uh, the type of sediment that represents a certain environment at a certain time, and there's different fossils. But at any rate, the uh, uh, research over the past decades uh, was very important in terms of uh, uh, some conceptual models in, in geology, like the, the sedimentary basin and the like. And uh, the Buffalo Museum of Science has been um, in the forefront of a lot of this stuff in the late 19th and early 20th century. So that's stratigraphy. That research is, is uh, very important. And there's a lot of uh, publications in our museum library uh, done from people associated with the Buffalo Museum or staff of the Buffalo Museum. All right, uh, so the collection is accumulated over the years. The, the biggest recent one is the uh, Byron Dig. And uh, for decades, the museum has gone a, a summer dig every year. Um, and uh, one of the first things we do is uh, set up the campsite, and get all our equipment going, literally drain the swamp and uh, trowel off layer by layer, uh, sieve the material through screens and um, study them. The material at the, that we've accumulated from the dig is um, still being used to research. Every so often we'll see Dr. Lobb or Michael Gramley or somebody come in and, and do some studying and, and photographing. Uh, in this particular case, it took a sample of a, a rib and uh, Dr. Lobb was studying uh, pathologies and was collaborating with some colleagues. So there's a, a very large um, uh, part of our collection is that yes. the same rib in situ as it is in, in the hand? Oh, uh, no, those... I just didn't have a photo of oh. the same one. That's, sure. a, that's a different bone. But the, at any rate, I, it would be nice if I did. I, I spent a few hours looking through old photos. But the, and part of our collection, a very, very small part, is, is uh, on the public displays. These are, are rotated from time to time. And um, uh, Casey would, would pull up some things for their aesthetic or educational value. Uh, the uh, museum, uh, here's a, a, a view of one of our, uh, uh, a view from the Our Marvelous Earth area of the museum. And um, 
Oh, and, Joe, can you go back to that again? Oh, sure. Yes. Just in, we were talking about stratigraphy. On the other side of that display case, you can see local stratigraphy examples, including the stratigraphy of the Science Museum. So if you want to learn a little bit about that, on the other side of this display case on the third floor, you can see some of our stratigraphic collection. Thank okay. you. Excellent and, plug for coming and, into the museum yeah, gallery. What, what lies beneath? You know, what would happen if you drill down? Excellent. Yeah. So uh, the uh, museum has done uh, some outreach at the uh, annual Gem and Mineral Show. Sometimes the uh, museum would set up a uh, display, depending on the theme, whether it was crinoids or garnets or uh, whatever, and, or the museum staff would be there to answer questions from the public or volunteers. Um, and uh, of course, Dr. Lobb uh, with uh, questions and, and other uh, people associated with the museum at our annual Gem and Mineral Show. Uh, a lot of the work in the geology department uh, deals not just with the collections, but we get visitors and phone calls and emails with people with objects asking to, uh, for identification. Sometimes these are very interesting and unusual. Uh, someone had a, a, a piece that uh, slag that uh, was uh, fluorescent in ultraviolet light. And again, uh, sorry, tell us what slag yeah. is. Oh, slag. Okay, from um, in the manufacture of iron, if you mixed iron ore with limestone and put it in a, a big furnace and heated it up, uh, what would happen is the iron would settle to the bottom and the um, limestone would combine with other uh, impurities in the iron ore and float to the top and form like a froth. And so there's this, uh, 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 the uh, iron uh, manufacturing, steel manufacturing process produces a lot of this material. It's a, it's a, uh, a porous, uh, holy uh, material. Um, called slag. And uh, sometimes, uh, in this particular case, if someone sent in photographs of a piece of slag that fluoresced in ultraviolet light, or uh, sometimes people would have fossils or buy fossils or find fossils uh, from a, a estate sale or something, or artifacts, uh, and, and ask us to identify them. Uh, sometimes they'd find something unusual, like sedimentary structures, or, uh, minerals. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is from, actually today, somebody found this along the beach and. Uh, it's a piece of pewter. Uh, concretions are an important uh, thing. Um, sometimes people will find objects and they'll wonder if this is important or they'll have an interpretation. Oftentimes people will find uh, pieces of slag and think they're meteorites. Uh, one time we did have a visitor that came in with an actual um, meteorite. And uh, yes, I was sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say yeah. um, we have, we have um, a lot of people coming in thinking that they found a meteorite. And usually, as Joe said, it's some kind of industrial runoff that we have a lot in the city because of our industrial past. But um, there was one person, I'll let Joe finish the story, where we do believe we had an actual meteorite come through our building. <laughs> and and, and it met all the criteria, and sure enough, but I uh, gave her uh, Scott McKenzie, uh, who's uh, with the, um, in Erie, Pennsylvania, with Mercyhurst College. And, He's got a, a, a very large collection of meteorites, and um, I referred her to him for more information. But uh, that's uh, uh, something that people uh, will find objects and then bring them into the museum and say, what is this? Uh, sometimes we get you know, teeth or bones or uh, things like that. Uh, this is, um, I'll talk a little bit about volunteers at the museum. Uh, we, uh, volunteers would work behind the scenes, uh, curating the collection, doing things like uh, uh, cataloging and, and uh, maintaining and repairing and uh, uh, identifying and that kind of type of thing. One big part of uh, activity for volunteers is uh, photographing material. Uh, the research collections have um, uh, what what Walt would call a pedigree. You have information about the material. Uh, it may or may not have been in some publication, but we would want to know the locality and an identification and uh, other information about it. Uh, we have right now a uh, database uh, for the museum. It's called Past Perfect that allows us to enter photographic information as well as all kinds of other information. We have other databases of uh, uh, spreadsheets on Excel and Access and, and the like uh, of uh, museum collections. The, the big thing right now is the uh, photographing and documenting and measuring and describing uh, material. Oftentimes, uh, uh, 
Well, we have, uh, this is uh, Mike Grenier, who's uh, photographing some material for uh, one of Dr. Lobb's publications. Uh, this is a, uh, a coral that's on its side here that was collected by uh, Carl Brett, uh, one of the world's leading paleontologists, in the, uh, when he was a young man from what is now Penn Dixie Quarry. And, and we have is, uh, some, uh, I just want to give a quick shout yeah, out. We've yeah. got some people from Penn Dixie Fossil Park and Nature Reserve yes. uh, in yes. the meeting today. We're so glad that they joined us. We love our partners down in Hamburg. And this core was, was cleaned in the museum um, and uh, alternate wetting and drying with, with uh, desiccants and like we, we removed the shale and you get to see the uh, carbonate fossil underneath. This coral has a crinoid hold fast on it. Uh, years ago, with uh, a lot of collections, what they would do is uh, scrape off the uh, what we call epi fauna and other things. But now we're interested in the, the ecology of the whole specimen. I had an intern who was a, uh, a combat photographer for the Marines, and he was familiar with the camera equipment that the museum has, and he took some really excellent photos for us. Here's one of a uh, Herkimer diamond. Um, the, uh, we had some volunteers uh, clean these things up and, uh, um, and interns and, and write up a report. I had some, uh, an intern uh, who needed a couple extra credit hours to graduate. So he, he, I think it was either one or two credit hours, he wrote up a report on the Little Falls Dolestone uh, with the Herkimer Diamonds and gave a presentation at the, uh, um, from the Buffalo Museum of Sciences table at the uh, Gem and Mineral Show that year. At the, um, this is one of his photographs, it's really pretty. Uh, sometimes we'll photograph all different kinds of things. Uh, Dr. Love had a collection of uh, Devonian coral from the center field of uh, central New York, and he wanted me to identify some of these. So what we did was um, took some things and what we'll do, we'll take a, a, I don't know if this shows up on the camera, but I'll, I'll come back again later. Cut a rock with a rock saw and uh, take a, a piece of the rock and glue it to a glass slide and then grind it down so thin that we could see light through it. And this is called a thin section, uh, not a thin slice, a thin slice is in the jelly. This is a thin section and we would identify uh, materials. Um, uh, we have uh, different insect traps in the museum and uh, uh, sometimes museum staff will uh, want uh, us to uh, photograph a bug with our uh, digital uh, camera on the microscope. And yeah, I'll uh, just like, right. I'll cut in again real quick. That's for me. I have to take care of our, our pest traps at the museum. And if there's a bug I don't recognize, Joe helps me photograph it with his microscope so we can upload it to a website. And then we get uh, people helping us to identify it. So I just want to say thank you, Joe, for taking those photos for me. I know they're not always pretty to look at, but they are very helpful for us here at the museum. We are huge fans of integrated pest. Yes, management. we are. <laughs> and just another plug, none of the volunteers are regarded as pests. So I, I, I particularly like this photo because of the light. But photography is very important in terms of volunteer activity. Once in a while, we'll get out in the field, but the biggest uh, field uh, collection is the uh, Byron Dig. And, um, there's a lot of uh, areas in Western New York that are, are very interesting geologically. Um, but the, the big work of the volunteer uh, is uh, sometimes tedious. Uh, in, in this particular case, uh, uh, Marcia used to be the uh, supervisor for the pathology lab at Buffalo General Hospital. And uh, she was here for a good number of years, uh, cleaning mud off of little tiny bones, big bones. And oftentimes with this bone, she could tell you where in the body the bone came from and many times from what animal it came from. So uh, we would uh, uh, do the uh, field uh, season in the summer and then all the rest of the year working on cleaning and, and identifying and uh, cataloging the uh, specimens. Uh, sometimes do some work in the lab. We have a little uh, petrology lab here. Um, the, uh, we borrowed a, a deer a skeleton from the uh, vertebrate uh, zoology section and we compared some of our mass and bones with analogous bones on the deer. Uh, right now, a number of volunteers are um, doing an inventory of the collection and um, uh, updating uh, databases. And, uh, so uh, Casey, you wanna talk a little bit more about your volunteers? Sure. I just wanna first say about, you know, interning here as well. When you do come here, we try to find your strengths and your interests and cater to that. 
and Joe has been amazing at that when he gets a new intern here, he really finds what they're interested in, what they're good at and what they wanna do. And he creates the perfect project for them to do using our collection. So we appreciate you know, everything that the interns do for us and all the work that gets done because of them. And as for the volunteers, as I said, I've been here since 2011. And um, that's when I started mostly working in the geology department. And that is when I met all the geology volunteers. And so since then, I have been working with the volunteers, a regular group that comes in every Monday. Um, they come in all day and they do different projects in our collection. Small things can be like rehousing some things, uh, clearing up, you know, clearing up storage space, uh, creating space for some of our collection. Um, one of the larger projects they did in the past was organizing and catalog the David Jensen collection, which is a big collection for us, mostly of mineral art. We have some examples of that that we can show you after the presentation. Um, the Jensen mineral art is really incredible stuff. It's a, it's a very large collection and it was a huge project that they took on that I couldn't imagine just one individual doing. Uh, we're lucky to have the volunteers that work together and take on such a large project. They got it cataloged, they got it stored, they got it organized. And that was one of the larger collections that I was able to be a part, like witness them doing. Um, smaller projects include maybe some light cataloging if we get a, a donation that just came in. They catalog it, they identify it, they put it in specimen boxes with specimen cards with all the information on it, just to keep our collection organized and easily um, uh, interpreted, which is also very important to us. And currently they're, the largest project they're working on is an, uh, an inventory project, starting with our mineral collection. They're going through our database, checking all the information to see that it's accurate as they pull out the specimens, adding uh, location, status, anything like that. And then in the future, we'll add photography to it. So again, you know, I, they come in every Monday, they've been here longer than I have. And I don't, for me, like Mondays are my favorite day of the week, because you can't be sad or, or too tired when you have all these volunteers coming in that are excited to be there and doing some of the best work. Um, our volunteer program here is amazing. We rely a lot on all the volunteers in all different departments, and we're very thankful to have them. So, and again, and Joe, thanks again for doing this presentation so we can highlight not just the collection, but the volunteers and the people behind the collection. So thank you. And I'll turn it back over to you, Joe. I'm just gonna Whatever. chime in right before Joe gets started and say that one of the things that I love about the volunteers that we have and the history of the Buffalo Society of Natural Sciences is that the society that we're a part of was founded on amateur interest and passions and to have that continued through the fabric of our history is just really heartwarming because there's so many times that people say, oh, science isn't for me, but even just having a passing interest and a curiosity can get you into the really um, worthwhile projects that enable us to share knowledge over decades. Um, so just, it's something that we couldn't do without. And any, time, any chance we get to brag about our volunteers and everything they do for the museum and how much they mean to us, we're going to do it. So thank you guys. That would summarize a, some of the kinds of things that interns do. With an intern, we, we'd get college credit and also would contribute to the museum. Uh, I sort of categorize some of the things they're doing, like working on specific objects or collections of objects that contribute their skills or doing research and topic of interest to them or lab work here to supplement some of their, their work at, uh, in, a, um, in their classes at Buffalo State. Uh, what, um, I had one intern who was an artist. We had a, an unusual, well, unusually well-preserved uh, cystoid, caryocrinitis. This is from the uh, uh, Slurian, um, the Rondicoit limestone from Niagara County and I'll crop here. So it had some very interesting features and so the uh, intern drew it and uh, did a uh, presentation on visual representation in geology, did a paper uh, or, and a poster and presented this at a uh, conference at Buffalo State. Uh, had another intern who was interested in dinosaur ecology. Well, unfortunately, the Buffalo Museum of Science has very few dinosaur fossils, but I, I told him we have an extensive co uh, collection of uh, Devonian coral and, um, there's a lot of uh, interesting paleoecology here. So there's a, 
uh, history of publication with a, a worm that lives symbiotically with a small tabulate coral, Pleuridicum. And uh, so what he did was uh, cleaned up a lot of the specimens in our uh, collection and studied them. And uh, Casey helped them get uh, some access to uh, uh, Lake Erie Shore where we uh, collected more objects. And um, he made some thin sections um, and did a paper and a poster. And uh, this is one of his thin sections. This is the uh, a thin section through this small little button coral pleuridicium. Uh, these are the septa, the, the coral would grow and, and grow new layers. These holes are the worm tooth. So uh, just like in modern coral, there's oftentimes worms and other animals that live symbiotically with the coral. Well, they've been doing that since the Devonian. This particular coral grew on a gastropod shell. Uh, this, um, you could oftentimes find these, uh, the impression of the, the uh, shell where the uh, coral grew and uh, they, they like to grow on snails. Anyway, this was a, a, his project. I had another intern who was interested in a specific rock. This was a boulder that's up in our collection. It was collected in the 1950s from the Southern tier. And uh, she wanted to uh, know a little bit more about it. So she identified these corals and using Bureau, uh, Bueller and Tesmer's Geology of Ray County book, she identified this boulder as being from the Onondaga limestone. The Onondaga limestone um, outcrops in Buffalo, New York, and this was moved uh, miles to the south. And so uh, from this, she could reconstruct the history. And then the uh, most likely explanation is that this was moved south by the glaciers. And this was buried in soil for God knows how many years. And the acidity of the soil uh, ate away at the matrix faster than the corals, making the corals stand out in relief. Uh, so she did a nice paper on that. That is uh, a really striking boulder. Yes, yes. I mean, it, it looks like uh, kind of the composites that you see in textbooks in order to show the diversity yeah. of an area. Um, but it's, it's all there naturally collected and, and the atmospheric impact of the acidic soil really did us a favor. A lot of work that would have been done by hand otherwise to reveal those coral specimens. That's, that's really incredible. I've not seen this in person, obviously. Okay. <laughs> I am we'll older. I got to come upstairs and go see the behind the scenes tour. Well, there's a lot of old buildings around that were quarried uh, 150 years ago, 100 years ago, and uh, with uh, from uh, quarries in the Onondaga. And over the decades, uh, just the differential erosion between the fossil and the matrix has caused a lot of these fossils to come out. Uh, sometimes even on old stone walls, you know, the, the slow weathering over many, many years just eats away at the matrix faster than the fossils. And, and that depends on, on the, the fossilization in the rock, but in this particular case, it did that very well. So she contributed a lot of information about this particular specimen, and uh, there's more work that could be done. Um, I had an intern who was interested in um, carbonate concretions. I had another intern and one of the volunteers who was interested in fluorescent minerals. So they went through the collection and with the ultraviolet light, and turned off the lights from time to time and made a list of what minerals and uh, where they're located that, that catalog. I had another intern who was interested in um, uh, astrophysics. Uh, he uh, uh, was in, uh, working on cataloging our meteorite collection. And he gave a presentation. I think he's in one of those earlier photos. And um, do I have time to tell an extra story? A little diversion? Yeah, so we're okay. at the halfway so, mark for our program. Right, so good. we've got uh, some good yeah. conversation time and yeah. we still have plenty this, of time for show and tell. This young man is from the, uh, one of my foreign students, he's from the Ivory Coast. And his native language is French. And um, I told him, well, you know, Buffalo, the uh, word Buffalo comes, the first Europeans to come here were French and the word Buffalo comes from the, they called the Niagara River Beaufleuve and um, beautiful river. And I, I said, asked her if he would like to see the uh, Niagara River. So I was driving from Buffalo State to the museum. And so we made a little detour to go along. And as I was driving uh, along the uh, uh, Niagara section of the throughway, he was staring at the river and his jaw dropped and it looked like his eyes were popping out. And he said, well, what are those white things? And um, I said, well, that's ice. It was in, this was in the spring semester. And the uh, um, ice uh, was breaking up from Lake Erie and, and big, uh, blocks that were floating down the Niagara River. 
And uh, this was the first time he saw ice in the river. Uh, from you know, being from Equatorial Africa, he would never seen it. So I'll remember that particular story long after I remember what he did with our meteorite collection. That was, and this is one of the meteorites. This uh, shows um, a catalog number and um, information about it. One of the important things about a research collection is the information. So we would need to have the, the specimen. We'd have to have something to attach the specimen to the, the information. So uh, one of our volunteers in the past, uh, Mike Grenier, um, did a um, macro where uh, some of the other volunteers were entering uh, information into an access uh, database. And the macro printed up the um, ID cards, the specimen labels and the catalog card in uh, Microsoft Word. Uh, we had oh, another just, can I just chime in yeah. real quick? Oh, Sorry, sure. Joe. I yeah. just want to thank you for pointing that out. Um, what makes you know collections unique and what we really need to have them to keep them organized and keep them displayable for our what in storage, whatever that whatever it is, like we have to have an identification and a locality that is very important to us. And the catalog number is also very important. Once it gets into the museum, every specimen gets a unique individual catalog number that goes into our database. And that's how we are able to identify and find items in our collection. So thank you, Joe, for pointing out how important the information that comes with these specimens is to our collection. Um, you know, with all the, with the very large collection that we have, and as Joe said, just a small part on display and an even larger part that is uh, behind the scenes and storage, all the information that we have on these specimens is very important. So thank you for mentioning that, Joe. <laughs> Another intern who was interested in environmental geology education. So she did a project. It didn't involve museum specimens, but uh, she's nonetheless an intern. And uh, some more interns who uh, were interested in models. Of, uh, we have stored in um, the loft area of the various uh, lane cases, lots of models that were once part of old displays. So Casey looked up uh, from our archives, uh, this display that was part of the uh, original displays with, from this building when it was built in 1929. So our students uh, used these uh, archival material and uh, also uh, cleaned the specimens and uh, photographed them and uh, cataloged them and uh, covered them with plastic and returned them to their resting place. But they, they did a nice job and. Uh, I'm sure the dinosaur models are happy. Uh, so there's all these different kinds of intern projects. One of the uh, uh, recent project is this uh, Collections Live. So what we do is we take some of our activity from behind the scenes and we're doing it in the Our Marvelous Earth area and the public is invited to come in and participate. So we've had a little uh, a number of youngsters uh, you know, testing uh, rocks for their physical properties and uh, Sometimes people will bring things in to be identified. And, uh, so far, we've been doing this for a couple months uh, on Wednesdays from 11 to 2, and the public is welcome. Uh, we usually have maybe about eight, eight or 10 people at any one given Wednesday. So uh, we'll see how this goes. Yeah, that's uh, uh, just, just saying that's every Wednesday on the third floor in one of the workshops up there. So please, if you're here, you know, it doesn't cost extra. Just walk through the doors, visit us. We're just trying to give you a taste of what we're, what you can normally see, only see behind the scenes. We're just trying to give you a taste of what, you, you know, this is what we're working on. This is what we're constantly doing. This is the large collection that we're working with. And just because, you know, you can't always see it, we're trying to make that available to more people. So please come visit us on Wednesdays if you can. And we're gonna keep trying to expand these so more and more people can get involved. This presentation is just a gateway to actually Seriously. getting you into the museum to come and see these things up close and in person. You can only describe it over video so much, you know, just sometimes you just gotta come here and see it for yourself. So now I'm going to uh, wrap this up and I guess we have questions and answers and also I could show you some material with our uh, document camera. Yeah, so right now, uh, Gabrielle is gonna go help Joe change over the camera so you can actually see some of our collections that we brought down. It's a variety of some stuff that Joe wanted to show or some of our favorite collections, some of the ones that we want to show you that don't get on display very often. Um, so we'll give them time to do that. Just as a reminder, I know some people may have come late. So just so everybody knows, we are recording this to be played back uh, in the public again. 
if for some reason you had your camera on or you you know you don't want to be part of the recording send an email to gabrielle we'll make sure we're edited so you don't have to be part of it um and then if you have any questions type them over in the chat otherwise we do have time at the end of the presentation uh for questions if you want to you know just do it through chat if you want to video us if you want to turn your camera on if you want to turn your microphone on um we're happy to take your questions and again you can always send us something in the chat so but thank you so much for uh taking part in this today we really appreciate it and we hope you're enjoying it and my favorite i think my favorite part is going to be when we can show you some of our collections so just can let you hear me know. okay yeah Okay, this is a Eurypter that was given to the museum by uh, Mr. Bennett, the owner of Bennett Quarry. Uh, like we said before, the Buffalo Museum of Science has uh, one of the world's largest collections of Eurypterates. And uh, we've got drawers and drawers of these. And, and, and there's lots of publications on, on this thing. Um, just to show you a few things here. Uh, this is a, one of the first uh, mineral specimens to be cataloged. This is a very low catalog number. This is a piece of calcite, variety Iceland spar. It has a property called double refraction. And this is also used in optical instruments. But this is a very, very nice piece. It's, it's uh, uh, crystal clear. Uh, we spoke before about the Jensen collection. Um, here's a, a chess set that was part of the uh, artwork that he uh, managed to collect, little carvings and um, that type of thing. Pretty cool. So what kind of stones are these made out of? Oh, do you know? Uh, Does it look like a soapstone, maybe? That's, that's exactly what it is, fun. yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, they, they feel it, yes, indeed. I, I could hold this up to the camera, but our participants can't feel it. But it so feels smooth. So, it's easy to carve. And then the detail on these. I bring this to every Gems and Minerals show. At the, at the fairgrounds for BGS. I don't care what the theme is. I just love this chess set. So I bring it out every year. So expect to see it when we have the Gems and Minerals show again soon. It's light and it's portable. And uh, here is one of a very, very, very old um, specimens, old uh, to be uh, for the museum. Uh, this was uh, some uh, uh, quartz crystals from uh, Dauphiné, France. This was collected by the uh, Charles F. Wadsworth. And this is a catalog number of 315, which is, we're, we're in the, uh, the, the six digits now for the catalogs and the like. This is one very, very old specimen. It's incredibly beautiful. And uh, the uh, uh, early history of the museum and as well as the Buffalo Geological Site had a lot of amateur mineral collectors and uh, a lot of this stuff wound up in the uh, collections of the Buffalo Museum of Science. We've had people doing research in the paleontology collection collections, but uh, so far, I, I don't, during the time I've been here as a volunteer, I haven't had anybody studying the minerals in any kind of uh, detail, but there's beautiful material here. Uh, sometimes the, uh, uh, there's an opportunity for uh, collecting material. The uh, highway construction of uh, Route uh, uh, 390 uh, cut through some fossiliferous layers and uh, the Devonian and Jay Cox Run member in, near East Avon, New York. And for a while, these uh, fossiliferous rocks were exposed. Uh, there's a, a local collector, uh, Jerry Clack, who uh, collected voluminous amounts of material, uh, shale, and then uh, uh, took the shale and removed, took these materials and removed the shale from the carbonate fossils. And you do this by uh, boiling them for hours and hours in a very, very strong soap. And so that the, uh, the carbonate material that's in the shell uh, will be exposed, the shale will be removed. And so what Jerry did was meticulously glue these pieces together. I'm not sure about the uh, uh, focus here, but this is a, uh, a uh, branching coral, it's a, a tabulate coral with uh, some bryozoa on it, growing on it, and a horn coral growing on it. And uh, the museum acquired this uh, through a trade. They uh, gave Jerry some old wooden cabinets, which uh, we replaced with the steel lane cabinets. That's another story. Mm -hmm. But, um, and we've acquired these beautiful specimens uh, for research. 
And then I just wanted to sure. recognize in the chat, we have a couple of questions. Casey, do you want to read through those? Oh, sure. Us? Thanks. You yeah, I've been replying to them on there, but this will be easy to do this. Um, so we had a question about the low catalog number. So basically, when we give a cat, we give a specimen a catalog number, it goes like in sequentially. We start at one. So if we have a mineral, it's like it starts with a D and then it's giving a number. And we like we said, we start at one. The calcite, I think it was five. Is that right, Joe? Oh, what should I get five of that? Yeah, D5. Wow, it was one of the first uh, yeah. materials we catalog. And um, so currently we are up to five digits in our mineral database. So that gives you an idea how many we have. And again, the ones with the lowest numbers are going to be some of the first that we, maybe not necessarily the first that we collected or for the institution, but one of the first that we gave a, a number to. So it would still be a very old uh, collection item that we have here. And then there was, uh, sorry, one about the meteorite. So I know on the specimen card, you saw the number P1911. That is the catalog number. The other number that was written on the rock, 4410, it probably refers to an accession number. So on specimens, we can have both the catalog number and the accession number. The accession number will usually refer to a year that we received it and what number from that year it was uh, accessioned into our collection. So some specimens have more numbers associated with them than others. Thank you for the questions. That's a great question and a very good point to make. Which number am I looking at and what format should I be looking at? And what at? does it mean? <laughs> and here's some more coral that was uh, collected and prepped by uh, Jerry Clack. It, I wanted to point out a lot of the work in museums is very slow, very tedious, involves many, many hours um, like in the preparation of specimens or sometimes it's uh, repetitious like in, in cataloging. But uh, on the other hand, it's very exciting because we're discovering a lot of very new things. The, um, with this kind of thing, we could reconstruct the history of the coral when, when it fell and when something else attached to it and that, um, that kind of thing. We have here a uh, model. Uh, let's see if I could get this in the doc cam. Well, while you're doing that, I just want to say we have another question um, that the sure. collection started before the museum was even built. And that is absolutely right. Uh, we started as a society, a society in 1861. And we didn't have this building until 1929 is when it opened. So Pete, like Joe said, we had amateur collectors, people collecting for hobbies. So a lot of this collection started before we even had a permanent place to store it. Uh, some of the places we would display things that would include the banks and libraries that we have here. Um, so once we had this permanent location, we had permanent storage for all these collections that people were collecting. And so we became a housing place for all the collection. And now we, it's our job to take care of it, keep it safe, preserve it, and make sure it lasts longer than all of we do into the future. So thank you for that question. From uh, the uh, fossils, sometimes it, they're a thin film on a uh, rack. Uh, we uh, artists could reconstruct what the animal looked like when it was alive. So tucked away in various places and from previous displays, there's a number of different models like from the Silurian Sea, we have this Terragoded and uh, a beautiful, beautiful model. The models themselves are works of art. And sometimes they, they may have been forgotten. Um, let's see, I'll swim him along over here so you can see, <laughs> see more of him. <laughs> but we've had um, some famous uh, artists in the museum uh, uh, making models of specimens in the geology collection and, and elsewhere in the museum. I'll do those live. Did you want to get the thin film? Oh, uh, let's see what else we could do. Uh, oh yeah, can you show them the thin sections that the intern was working on? Right, so this was my intern that was doing a uh, uh, paleoecology study. So we had some, uh, I don't know how, how well this focuses. Yeah, uh, if I go like this. Go. So we did is he collected material from Lake Erie shore. And uh, we cut this on the rock saw, uh, polished down a surface. This has one of these pleuridicum corals in it and uh, cut off a slice and glued it to the glass slide. So here um, that I showed you the slide that was made from the piece that was attached to it. So here's the, uh, the coral, there's the gastropod and another gastropod. Gastropod is a fancy word for snail. 
So what we do is just want to hold it sideways so we can see how thick that oh. is. Oh, yeah. So what we would do is take this, glue it to a glass side, and then uh, put this on a machine and cut another slice from it and just grind it down. So I don't have the, the slide that Nate used, but here's another slide from uh, one of Dr. Lobb's corals. Um, oh, and we can put a light underneath that. Oh, that would be cool. Let's see. I don't, uh, avert your eyes just in case. <laughs> Oh, all right. oh, that so, looks awesome. Yes. And so we have lots of these uh, photographs of uh, thin sections, and we put the number on the slide. Um, yeah, there we go. Now, Joe and I will have to adjust our eyes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was really effective. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you want to switch cameras and sit down? Uh, sure. Uh, I'll, oh, sure. I'll, I'll tell you more story just for entertainment. How's that? And then so we're just switching back cameras and then um, Joe will be able to wrap up his presentation and we'll have time for more questions and answers. Um, again, you can add them to the chat or if you don't mind, you know, putting yourself off mute, you can ask questions that way as well. So go ahead, Joe. Is there any last minute? Uh, sure. What one task of uh, volunteers is uh, babying and maintaining a various equipment make sure it, it, it continues to work and we don't get hurt or doesn't destroy anything. Uh, the museum on the, the, the top floor is uh, where the geology department is and we, that's where our, our geology lab is. And some of the equipment is very old. We have this uh, thin section equipment that has uh, suction lines and water. The water will uh, uh, lubricate the saw to keep it cool so it cut through rock. And the suction lines will, will hold the glass plate to the uh, arm that that um, we use to hold the rock to uh, cut it and grind it down. And um, one day, uh, one um, piece of tubing after the other would uh, break and it would spray out water. So in the process of making thin sections, we'd get a little shower. Well, what happened was the, uh, the tubing was old and it started to deteriorate and the museum increased the water pressure. So we'd get, better running water in the toilets would flush better on the top floor. And that slight increase in water pressure was more than the uh, tubing could handle. So we replaced the tubing on the thin section equipment and it works works fine now. Um, that's but yeah, we good. do have a lot of equipment in geology that is old, but still works. But I think eventually we might just have to catalog the equipment to our collection too. So it'll just be an antique. <laughs> It could use tender, loving care. We, we yes. have the ability yes. to do something. Uh, so here's a, an opportunity for a volunteer or intern if they were uh, so inclined, uh, uh, mechanically uh, talented and, and creative, I right, could work with uh, some of our equipment. And that's something that we do with our exhibits as well. And mm -hmm. things like the models, you know, they're built as an interpretive device for the society. But then over time, the, the teaching tool itself becomes part of our collections and eventually will, um, if it stands the test of time, uh, gets an accession number of its own um, and cataloged into the, the history of what we have on hand. So that's really fascinating. If you One stand still long enough, we'll catalog you into our collection. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> One of the uh, things in, in terms of being a volunteer is that most of the, all the volunteers now that, uh, came on board during uh, Dr. Laub's tenure, and he was uh, very, very fussy about uh, instructing the volunteers on how to do things, and uh, uh, the museum wants us to uh, be very familiar with all of the equipment and the safety uh, rules involved, and so uh, before we uh, use anything, uh, so uh, I had uh, some familiarity with this from working with uh, uh, Ed uh, you'd be in Buffalo State with uh, similar kinds of equipment. We have a question from Catherine. She says, Joe, what does your personal collection look like? I feel like it's, I feel like item. it's e very large or minimal. So what's okay. your personal collection well, like? First of all, the, there's a distinction made between the professional geologist and the collector. And I've always stayed, said I'm not really a collector. I do have boxes and boxes of racks in the basement. <laughs> I bring things home and people will go places and they would give me racks. Uh, but I, I am not, not much of a, a, a collector, even though I do have a basement full of racks. Uh, uh, it, it, You're an acquirer. Yes. A collector. I, yes, yes. I think it sounds like people assume that you would want it. So they just give it to you. 
Oh, I, I really love it. You know, people would go on trips, hunting trips, fishing trips, or travel, and then bring me back a, a rock from this place or that. And so, I, yes, I do have a collection of rocks, but uh, I, if I were to regard myself as a collector, I, I'm a collector of books. I, I like uh, books. I have a lot of books at home. That's how, you know, that's how we get some of our collection here, too. Some people take a walk through uh, different parks or through Tift, and they find something. It's like, hey, do you want this? And sometimes we will take it. So that's how the museum gets some of its collection as well. It sounds like there might be a divide between uh, people that acquire physical items and people that catalog the physical items that they require. Um, I definitely have a lot of things, but the, the catalog is all mental. And so if, if someone were to come to my house and look at the natural history collections that I have, they would not be able to tell at a glance what they are because nothing is labeled. I don't think the distinction between the collector and the professional geologist is, is valid. We've had some um, professional geologists that were also collectors. And, uh, and there's a lot of professional geologists that aren't collectors. Yeah, it's kind of an arbitrary distinction of do you get paid to do the thing that you <laughs> love or do you just do the thing that you love and get paid in some other way? And it doesn't really diminish your expertise either way. Um, so that's an interesting way of framing it too. You know, what is professionalism in this? In this there case? is a distinction in the vocabulary that we use. The geologists will oftentimes use technically precise terms and maybe a, a collector might use other terms or a lapidary artist would use other terms. Uh, uh, I don't like it when people don't talk geology, like when they'll call a, a countertop granite and it's really not granite, or someone will call shale slate, that type of thing. Uh, but uh, that's just me. I, differences, yeah, differences in jargon. During, yeah. Yeah, well, when this, you know, you know. Yeah, doing this presentation, you guys are translating from geology to English. So. That's true, <laughs> yes. Um, I'm just gonna put a link in the chat for feedback. Um, if you have a few minutes to complete that today, that would be really wonderful. We still do have eight minutes left in our program time. Um, so if anyone has any additional questions for Joe or for Casey or for myself, um, we would love to hear them. I'm sort of hoping that we'll get some volunteers in the future that are uh, very knowledgeable in uh, minerals and mineralogy. Uh, uh, most of us have a, a good working knowledge of common rocks and minerals. But there's a lot of uh, very unusual things in our collection. Um, a lot of the uh, volunteers have a, a, a good feel for paleontology and fossils. Yeah, yes. Oh, Catherine? Oh, you want to volunteer? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, I'm maybe in the winter time. We'd um, love to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joe, I. I I, because I kind of know this answer with Gabrielle, but Joe and Casey, what got you guys interested in natural sciences, like, you know, geology or paleontology initially? Like, how old were you and when did you first get interested in the science? Joe, do you want to take it first? Oh, okay. I was a uh, uh, child. We grew up on the west side of Buffalo. It was uh, Low income community and uh, worked. Uh, uh, I, I would oftentimes play in, uh, outside and we would, uh, you know, uh, look at sticks and stones and trees and stuff like that. Uh, it, sort of different from uh, other uh, children who were blessed with huge amounts of toys and stuff. So uh, I was always uh, interested. It was just such a refreshing thing to, you know, to be outdoors. Uh, you know, when, when I was a, a little kid, you know, you wanted to be a uh, a fireman or a cowboy, and then uh, uh, at one time I wanted to uh, be a super scientist like Dr. Zarkoff in the uh, Flash Gordon movies. But then uh, when I was in, in college, I decided you know, to be a geology major. It's always interested in geology, it's a special appeal. Geologists are special people, they like science and the outdoors. It's a winning combination. That's uh, great, yeah. As for me, I actually, my background wasn't in geology. I, uh, I grew up, my, uh, my dad was a ge is a geologist, retired now. But, you know, I grew up with him traveling all over the world, going to different places, you know, as a geological engineer. And sometimes he would come back with like different specimens. I remember we had a nice collection of quartz in our, in our house. So he would also come back with some of that stuff as well. So I kind of grew up with that in the background, but it did give me an interest in basically the world around me. Uh, my background is actually in museum studies and anthropology. So that's where I started my studies was in anthropology, just the curiosity of the world and the culture and, you know, 
where we live. And when I got to the when so then my I uh, focused more into museum studies, and that's how I got here into the Science Museum after doing an internship and some volunteering. Um, that's how I got into the museum and into the collections department, where I mostly work behind the scenes. And you know, aside, you know, most of my uh, work is in geology right now, but my job is to take care of all the collections on and off display. And I feel very lucky that I get to work with such a lovely collection. And from because I'm not a collector, I I do not collect. I don't. It's for me. It's like you know, I really like what I see, but I just I don't like a lot of clutter. And I know a lot of people don't say collections or clutter, and I would agree, but it, that I've never been a huge collector. So it's everybody thinks it's weird that I work at a science museum. Like I don't need to collect. Everything I want to see is where I work. So I think that's that's a really excellent point. And both of those things. So getting. Uh, your workplace as the place where all of the fascinating things are held is a, a great asset to living minimally. Um, yes. And then also just the, the common thread of spending time outside. So my background is more in um, natural sciences and ornithology and things like that. Um, but just it comes from sitting outside and playing outside as a kid and just being interested in the things that are around you. So what is this stick? Why is this stick different from this other stick? What's that bird? Does it eat the same thing as the other birds? Or does it eat different things? There was a science fair project that I did in elementary school. Um, but just as much as you can, encouraging people of any age to try to spend some time outside. Um, this is also kind of a good segue for me to bring us to the end of our program, because I would like to plug uh, that you can visit Tift Nature Preserve if you are looking for a safe and healthy place to spend some time outside. Tift Nature Preserve is open year round. It's free and it's open from dawn until dusk. You can visit that uh, just to the south of Buffalo. Um, and then also, if you'd like to visit us inside, you can see us open from Wednesday through Sunday. And right now we're in the final weeks of Lost Beauty 2 the Art of Museum Stories, featuring the paintings of artist Alberto Ray. And one of the things in the exhibit there is a Eurypterid that has been painted on a massive scale. So if you think about an object that's about this big being painted on a six foot canvas, so come in and see the beautiful artistic representations of some of our pieces in our collection. And then we can also segue that into paleontology for our next exhibit that we're getting. Uh, in February, we will be having a traveling exhibit called Antarctic Dinosaurs. So we'll be bringing, you know, come see that. We'll have an amazing display on there. And um, yeah, you know, it's a great way to end our paleontology talk and our geology talk that we're going to have an amazing geology exhibit coming to our museum in the future. And also our next conversations in science. So you can find them on our website. Um, the links are in the chat at sciencebuff.org forward slash programs, forward slash conversation, hyphen in, hyphen science. Um, but our next one in January is going to be all about Antarctic science. And so we'll talk a little bit about what those, uh, I have two geologists that were studying in Antarctica and they'll be able to share their experiences um, living in Antarctica and also what their work was like with the geology cores that they drilled there through the Antarctic Research Facility. So. If you like rocks and you like being cold, you might live in Buffalo. Come back to the next Conversations in Science. Thank you so much for being here today. We Thank really you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Take care. Bye, guys. <laughs>